really try to bring up in our mind an altruistic intention, which means caring about others, thinking about others, and how they are suffering. So there's lots of people suffering right now as a result of COVID and other kinds of problems, wars, conflicts, economic problems, many, many problems in the world right now. So we know many people are experiencing difficulties as a result of these. But even those not experiencing those kinds of difficulties still have other difficulties. Every sentient being in samsara is in a state of dukkha, unsatisfactoriness. Everyone has some kind of problems, even if it's just the fact that our mind isn't free of karma and afflictive emotions, greed, hatred, ignorance, and so forth. So it means we're like in a prison, not completely free to experience the peace, the joy, the positive states of mind that we have the potential to experience, liberation, enlightenment. So just the fact that we're not yet there in those states, it's itself a kind of dukkha, unsatisfactoriness. Really try to open your heart and feel how wonderful it would be if all living beings everywhere who are not yet enlightened could meet with all the causes and conditions that we need to awaken our potential for enlightenment and take an interest in doing that, really wanting to follow the path that leads to liberation and enlightenment. And may we ourselves do whatever we can to help bring that about. We ourselves need to learn about the path and practice it to the best of our ability, and then share what we've learned with others help them also get going on this path towards liberation and especially towards full enlightenment Buddhahood. So try to make that your reason, your motivation for being here and participating in this session. Okay, so continuing with the review of Shantideva's engaging in the Bodhisattva's deeds. Last week we finished the review of chapter 3 and Venerable Children had requested that we go through the Bodhisattva vows because there are verses in chapter 3 related to the Bodhisattva vows and um, so we started that last week and got up to ver- uh, root mm, transgression number three. And um, uh, Venerable Pema asked a question about, I can't remember exactly what your question was, but it was something to do with the nature of the Bodhisattva vow. And I said I would check on that and get back to you. So... Um, In Alex Berzin's uh, explanation uh, that we were going through, he says that a vow is form. And uh, I think earlier in the text, 
back in chapter one. I don't know if you remember when this was, but uh, Venerable was going through um, Gelsabje's commentary, which was translated by a German monk, Venerable Fedor. And he had a note in there that said, the bodhisattva vows are mental factors. I don't know if you remember that. There was a question about that that came up. And I had been communicating with Geshima Kelsang Wangmo to ask her about this question. So I have answers. <laughs> so what are what is the nature of the bodhisattva vow? Is it form? Is it mental factor? Is it something else? And um, so her response is, it depends on which school you're talking about. Different schools have different assertions. And um, uh, the Madhyamika Svatantrika, Chidamatra, and Sotrantika schools, so those three schools say that vows are mental factors. And I, th- I think that would probably go both for Pradimoksha vows, like the vows we have, uh, nun vows, monk vows, and also the bodhisattva vow. So probably, according to them, vows are mental factors. However, Madhyamika Prasangika does not agree with that. They have a different explanation. It's a little complicated, so... <laughs> So according to the Madhyamika Prasangika, the Pratimoksha vows, like our, you know, Shikshamana, Bhikshuni vows, also lay vows, those vows, or precepts, however you want to call them, they are considered form. They are subtle, it's a subtle kind of form, not a gross form like this table or our bodies, it's a subtle form that cannot be perceived by any of the five senses. So it's one of the forms that can only be perceived by mental consciousness. And they're said to be form because they relate to actions of body and speech. So, for example, we take the vow to not kill, to not steal, to not lie, and so forth. So that vow is a subtle kind of form that stops those kinds of actions of body and speech. Now there is an intention involved, and intention is the mental factor. So there has to be the mental factor of intention to say, I'm going to take this vow, I'm going to keep this vow. But the vow itself, the vows themselves, are considered this subtle kind of form sometimes compared to a dam, you know, a dam that um, stops water from going in a certain direction. So the vows stop our actions of body and speech from doing things that are unwise, unskillful. And our Pradimoksha vows stop when we die because we only promise to keep them for that long. When we, take our, when we take those vows, we say, until I die. So when we die, they stop. They don't go with us to the next life. Okay, that's Pradimoksha vows. Then Bodhisattva vows are different. Um, Bodhisattva vows are not related to actions of body and speech, but mainly mental actions, um, things we do with our mind. That's not completely true. They do. Some of them do relate to actions of body and speech, but it's mainly mental. So uh, when Geshima first, you know, replied to my question, she said she thinks they are mental rather than form. And, and, um, but she wanted to check with her teacher, Geshe, Tupton Pelsang, and he said, yes, that is correct. They are not form. Bodhisattva vows are not form. They are mental. And imprints, when we take Bodhisattva vows, there are imprints in the mind that go 
to the next life and in fact all the way to enlightenment. So they don't stop when we die. So there are imprints on the mind. And then because she said, um, she, both she and Geshe Pelsang said they are mental, then that made me wonder, does that mean they are mental factors or they are main minds? Because mental usually means it's the mind. So I just got her reply this morning, and she said, no, <laughs> that's not what she meant. When she, when she said mental, it just means it's not related to the body, to physical things, but rather to the mind. But the vow itself, which is left on the mind in the form of imprints, is an abstract composite. So it's a pakchak, um, um yeah, so it's it's neither mind nor form, but this third type of uh, impermanent phenomena, the abstract composite, or sometimes called non-associated compositional factors. So she said the vow itself, uh, the vow is mental in the sense that it's related to the mind, deposited on the mind, and remains on the mind until enlightenment, but the vows itself themselves are uh, imprints, which are this third type of um, impermanent phenomena, abstract composites. So, <laughs> but my thought is there could be different answers by different masters. So depending on who you ask, there could be some who say it's form, others who say mental factors. Be, maybe it's just not clearly explained in the in the classical text, and so masters debated about it and came up with different conclusions. So keep the mind open to that, but I hope that answers your question, <laughs> or at least gives food for thought. I do remember in the, the review a few weeks ago that I did that abstract composites need to depend on something else to exist. So chances are these imprints have to depend on either an action of body or speech or some other factor for them to come into being. So, yeah. yeah, and also they're not just floating around in space, they're on the mind. At least this, yeah, this kind of imprint, other abstract composites, you know, um, like year, month, but they depend on, we were talking about this at lunch the other day, numbers, <laughs> you know, it's like human mind will, uh, Con, con, they're, they're, they're conceptual things, you know, numbers and periods of time and seasons and, and so on and so forth. These are conceptually constructed things, but they are related to certain phenomena in the environment. I, I don't fully understand, but yeah, definitely they are dependent phenomena. Everything is a dependent phenomena, so they are dependent on various things. Yeah, so in the case of bodhisattva vows, they would be dependent on a person learning about bodhicitta and contemplating bodhicitta and getting really, really, really inspired to the point where they feel, I want to commit myself to, you know, following this path, working for the sake, for the sake, for the sake of all sentient beings, working for enlightenment. I want to take these vows. So then you either on your own in the, you know, in front of a statue or in the presence of a master, you make this vow, you take these vows, and then it becomes imprints on your mind that stay there all the way up to enlightenment. Unless, well, I guess, yeah, she did say if you break your vows or you lose your vows, yeah, then you, you I guess you would lose those imprints, but you can always retake them, take them again. And also, um, she said, it's better to say bodhisattva vow rather than vows because it's really one thing. Um, because when you uh, commit any of the 18 downfalls, the root downfalls, you lose the whole thing. You don't only lose that vow, you lose the whole thing. So it's more correct more precise to say bodhisattva vow, and it consists of 18 root downfalls and then 46 um, secondary transgressions. But yeah, in a loose way, we do talk about the bodhisattva vows, but 
in the in Tibetan they have a different different way of talking about them. And then um, so last week we we looked at the first three of the root downfalls. And with the second one, the way it was explained in Alex Berzin's uh, explanation was a little um, unclear because he said something about, oh, it's the third one, not listening to others' apologies or striking others. And he said the first refers to an actual occasion when yelling at or beating someone. (laughs) And either that person pleads for forgiveness or someone else begs us to stop, and we refuse. So I checked this other commentary by Dakpo Rinpoche, which is very, very nice, very clear. And he says, um, uh, yeah, there's two ways that this vow can be transgressed. The first way is not accepting another's sincere apology due to anger. So if someone has done something hurtful uh, towards you and then they sincerely feel sorry and, uh, and they're apologizing, asking for forgiveness, but you're so angry at them that you reject what they're saying, you refuse to accept their apology, and you might also speak harshly to them. So that's one way the vow is broken. And and at that point in time, you know, there's no beating of the other person. You're not beating the other person. So that's the first way. But the second way is if, in addition to being angry at them and not accepting their apology, you might even hit them, um, motivated by anger. Okay. So either of those two things, if you do them, then you're um, this... Um, uh, downfall is committed. The initial explanation is from Alex Berzin, and he the he, one I gave last yeah. week. Yeah. Oh, but this one that you mentioned the first one, when you're beating someone—that's what he said. Yeah. Is that coming from a monastic context when, like, they're disciplining other monks and they want to make it seem like that's it's not compassionate? Mentioned. Because how is that acceptable? No, I don't think... <laughs> how is that? You're beating someone. I don't know. It's just a, a paragraph, and it's not explaining anything about context. I don't think it necessarily has to be a monastic. It could be lay people. Um, just someone is so angry at this other person that they're beating them. But anyway, just to p- put that aside. I, I don't think that explanation... I don't, and maybe he got that explanation from his teacher. I don't know. But I'd, to me, the one by Dr. Rameshe makes a lot more sense. So there's kind of two levels of it. One is you're not listening, not accepting the apology of the other person, continuing to be angry at them, and possibly also speaking harshly to them. And then, so that's one way you can transgress this vow. And another way is if you also hit them. <laughs> so the hitting part only comes in the second the second way of, of transgressing it. So you'd have to be pretty angry to uh, behave that way, right? Someone's really begging you, please, I'm so sorry, please, you know, forgive me. <laughs> yeah. And then also with number two, um, I had uh, mentioned that I'd heard that like when there's many, um, if you're in India, for example, there's many, many, many beggars um, holding out their hand, asking for something. Do you have to give to every single one of them? <laughs> I heard that, uh, no, that's not the case. Because this is really talking about a person who's, who's really in need and has no one else to help them. So I did find that explanation in here. Um, Yeah. So this is vow number two, which is not uh, sharing your material wealth and not sharing the Dharma with someone who is in need. And so Dr. Roche says the object, that is the person who is in need, um, 
They may has to be someone who's truly in need. They may be hungry and have nothing to eat, have no clothes to wear or no roof over their head. Furthermore, they must have no other recourse but us. So they have nobody else who could possibly help them. They must not have any family or friends or someone to guide them that they feel they can trust. In other words, when people are in need material or materially or spiritually, but have the possibility of appealing to someone else for assistance, there's no fault in refusing their request. And that applies to spiritual instructions as well. So it's only when the person really has no one else to help them, and if you refuse to help them, that is when this downfall is committed. Because there are sometimes situations where it is hard to give to everybody, you know, physically or time-wise. And he also adds something here. We might wonder whether we contravene this vow when we do not give money to charities that solicit our financial support for projects in the third world, for example. You know, we might get a lot of emails (laughs) or ordinary mail asking for donations and, you know, in order to not transgress this, do we have to give something to every one of them? It seems unlikely that refusing donations to charities constitutes a transgression of the bodhisattva vow. But to check, we must consider each aspect of the transgression. The first requisite is that the person is truly in need. And the second is that he has no one else to turn to for assistance. This suggests a personal contact and a personal approach. Right? So somebody's actually approaching us directly. And um, the procedure and fundraising for charities is far from personal, and the soliciting charity itself is not in need. I mean, they actually have many people that they can apply to for help. That's not to say we shouldn't give to them, <laughs> but the question is, in, in, you know, is it possible that we might transgress a, a downfall by doing this? So he seems to be saying, thinking about it, that if we do not give to all of these charities, we are not transgressing our, our, our vow. Does that make sense? But we do what we can. And then one other thing, it's usually explained at the end, but I'll mention it here, um, that in order to have a complete downfall, it's not enough just to do the action, but there needs to be these four binding factors, four factors um, together with it. One of them is not regarding it as detrimental, this action. So you have no sense at all that this is a wrong thing to do. If you do have a sense that it's wrong, then that condition is missing. And the second is not giving up the wish to do it again. So you do have a sense of the wrongness of the action and you feel, yeah, I probably shouldn't do this again. (laughs) Then you would be missing that condition. But if you think, ah, this is great, I want to do it again and again, then that would be uh, one of the conditions to make it complete. And the third one is being pleased about doing it, feeling good that you did that. I'm glad I didn't give to that guy. He doesn't deserve it. (laughs) So if you do feel a sense of remorse, a sense of, oh, that's not such a good thing to do, then that condition would be missing. And the fourth one is having no integrity or consideration for others. So those are these two mental factors that are virtuous mental factors and very, very important in our spiritual practice and our practice of ethics and so on. So integrity is just having a sense of personal, um, I don't know, kind of personal awareness that this isn't a good thing to do. I'm a Buddhist, I'm a monastic, or whatever. And it's not right for someone like me to do that kind of action. So that's the sense of integrity. And then consideration for others is going beyond thinking about me, but thinking about others, that this isn't a good thing in the eyes of others. 
of seeing me do this, you know, is not good for their minds. So if those two mental factors are totally absent, <laughs> then that becomes one of the conditions. So you have to have all four of those conditions in order for the vow to be uh, completely broken. If you have, you might have two or three or one, then it does become a kind of a fault that needs to be confessed and purified, but you haven't completely uh, fallen down. You haven't lost the vow. So considering all of that, it's, you know, with many of these, it's not that easy to commit a, a downfall unless you're really far out there in um, terms of your mental mental state. And then also uh, in Dr. Rameshe's explanation, which is also based on Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary, this text. I don't know if there's a translation of it, but... Um, it's a very complete commentary on the Bodhisattva vow. Um, so his explanation is based on that. And he says in Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary, with regard to each vow, or at least the root downfalls, uh, it talks about different aspects of each downfall. For example, the object, and in some cases the subject, and sometimes the, the content or the substance it's being related to your motivation and so on, how the action is done. So different things are being considered. Okay, so continuing with number four, I'll read Alex's um, explanation and then there's additional things from Dr. Rinpoche. So Alex says, discarding the Mahayana teachings and propounding made-up ones. And he says, this means to reject the correct teachings about some topic concerning bodhisattvas, such as their ethical behavior, and to make up in their stead a plausible yet misleading instruction on the same subject. Claim it to be authentic, and then teach it to others in order to gain their following. An example of this downfall is when teachers who are eager not to scare away prospective students condone liberal moral behavior and explain that any type of action is acceptable so long as it does not harm others. <laughs> I don't know if there's teachers who do that, but it's possible. And we need not to be a teacher to commit this downfall. We can commit it even in casual conversation with others. Now, Dr. Ribeshe, on the other hand, is, his explanation is a little more strict. Um, he says, uh, the first part, discarding the Mahayana teachings, he says it must involve rejecting the entire collection of Mahayana scriptures, vast and profound. So, he seems to be saying, if you, it, it, you wouldn't commit this downfall if you're talking about just one aspect of the Mahayana teachings. It has to be the whole thing, the whole of the Mahayana teachings. And the action must be something verbal. You actually, for example, saying they are not the word of the Buddha. I think that's the main way that this downfall is committed. If you say Buddha didn't teach the Mahayana, which is actually quite a few people who do say that. <laughs> Even some scholars... <laughs> Um, masters and practitioners of other traditions, so rejecting the whole of the Mahayana. So that's the first part of it. And then he says, and number two, uh, number two is teaching something false, false doctrine. And I'm emphasizing the and because in the Pearl of Wisdom book, it says or, making it sound like you could commit this downfall if you do one or the other. But Dr. Ramesh's commentary and Alex's, and I looked at another commentary as well, and they don't say or, they say and. So again, there could be different <laughs> teachings or interpretations, but it seems like according to these commentaries, you have to do both of these two things. So you have to reject the Mahayana and teach something that's false. 
And the meaning of a false doctrine is it's something that misleads people. This is Dr. Ramesh's commentary. Um, it's false because it seems to be a spiritual path, but actually does the opposite. For example, it uh, reinforces afflictive emotions like anger and attachment and invites negative conduct like killing. So you're teaching something to people. Um, maybe, and I guess you're actually saying this is the true teachings, but these teachings increase their afflictions. It causes people to have more afflictive emotions rather than less and possibly engage in um, negative actions, non-virtuous actions. So it seems like you have to, it's pretty far, <laughs> going pretty far. Um, but still, I think what Alex said is, is helpful too, that we do have to be careful when we're teaching or even just having conversations with others. And our intention might be good, you know, we don't want to pe scare people away. <laughs> But if we're actually going to the extent of saying, oh, yeah, those teachings were not taught by the Buddha, you can ignore those, and listen to this one instead. <laughs> Follow this one instead. So that's, that's going pretty far. But it's possible. It's possible that people could do that. Yes, um, came to mind, I knew somebody, um, I shared an apartment met with, and she was a student of a teacher who um, recommended that um, all his students have sexual relationships and active sexual contact every day. <laughs> he was really honored, apparently. He was what? Uh, really uh, promoting that, that it's important for your spiritual development to have sex every day, many times <laughs> if possible, and the first thing in the morning. <laughs> so... Yes, a Buddhist teacher who, who was um, when, later on had uh, has been discovered as being um, controversial, yeah. but at that time not. And yeah. this person I knew, she um, did not see that this is a problem. So she really believed in that. Later teacher. on, she um, recognized it, but not in, in the first yeah. years. So, yeah, there are all kinds of teachers and teachings out there. <laughs> so we, we always have to be very careful as we are taught that we need to check teachers and we also need to check teachings, not just blindly follow. Okay, so those first four uh, root downfalls are from, uh, the, the source of them is Asanga's uh, text, one of his texts called the Bodhisattva Bhumi, grounds of a bodhisattva. So in that text, he presents the bodhisattva vows as only four root downfalls and 46 secondary ones. But he said in his text that we could refer to the sutras to find other examples of um, downfalls or faults for a bodhisattva. So then Shantideva, I guess he came later than a sangha. In his text, the Sik Siksha Shamu, <laughs> I can't say that one, Siksha Samuchaya, Compendium of Trainings, um, listed uh, 14 root downfalls. So that means 14 on top of four, making 18 altogether. And um, he got those from the Akasha Garbha Sutra. And he also got one from the Sutra of Skillful Means. So this is just explaining the origin of how we came to 18 uh, root uh, downfalls. How many is there in the Chinese tradition? What's the list? Does anyone remember? Chinese number? Yeah, but it's a different number, and some of the vowels are different as well. And there's also a text called The 20 Verses on the Bodhisattva Vow by Chandra Goman, um, another Indian master, and that, that was a commentary to a Sangha. So there's the translation of that text in here. So anyway, there's a progression over time of 
how the the number of vows that we take in the Tibetan tradition, how they came about. So anyway, the first four mainly came from a Sangha, and the remaining uh, 14 uh, were compiled by Shantideva. Okay, so continuing on, number five is taking offerings intended for the triple gem, three jewels. So Alex says, this downfall is to steal or embezzle either personally or through deputing someone else, deputing, deputing, asking someone else to do it, anything offered or belonging to the Buddha's Dharma or Sangha, and then to consider it as ours. The Sangha in this context refers to any group of four or more monastics. Examples include embezzling funds donated for building a Buddhist monument or temple, for printing Dharma books, or for feeding a group of monks or nuns. So Dr. Ramesha gives more examples of property that uh, could belong to the three jewels that could be stolen. So with regard to the Buddha, it could be uh, actual Buddha images, statues or paintings or stupas, because these represent the Buddha. People do this sometimes. When I was in, yeah, in Asia, I heard sometimes people break into temples and steal their statues. It does happen. So it's, well, they probably don't have bodhisattva vows, but anyway, it's still a very negative thing to do. Um, also, if we were to steal their ornaments or clothes, we, you know, we often put um, clothing or, you know, ornaments, necklaces and so forth onto statues. So that's something else that could be stolen from the Buddha. And then for the Dharma, Dharma books, also covers or materials that are used to print them, like paper and ink that are used to print Dharma materials, money for printing Dharma materials, or offerings placed before them. In temples, sometimes people put offerings to the Dharma texts, um, the scriptures. So those would be examples of Dharma property that we might steal. And then property of the Sangha, he says the Sangha could be either a single Arya being or a group of four fully ordained monastics. So a single Arya, whoever, I mean, it's hard to know who's an Arya, but anyway, <laughs> if you knew for sure someone was an Arya, that would be a, a Sangha or a group of four fully ordained. So anything that is the property of the Sangha, um, such as money, food, and so forth, uh, would constitute this downfall. But he said something interesting in here. I had never heard this before. He said, as for the subject, the one who's doing this stealing, if the thieves are monks or other members of the Sangha, transgression occurs only when they take something that does not belong to their own community, but to another community, or to one of the other two jewels. So that means if we are part of this community and we take something from, you know, that's a property of Shravasti Abbey, it's not a downfall. Have you heard that before? It has to be if, if we steal from another Sangha community or something else that belongs to the three jewels. That's interesting. I remember when we talked about this before, um, Venerable Children said the reason why um, uh, it would be uh, such negative karma when we take from the Sangha and why it's so difficult is because in the big monasteries, many people come and go, come and go. So if you took something and then you uh, 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 um, 
told people about it and then wanted to purify, but if all the people who were there at the time when you took something now were gone, or some of them were gone, then you wouldn't be able to really fully uh, confess it. And so that's why it's such a strong mm. one, she said. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering if what he's saying here applies to this as a bodhisattva downfall. And if we think of other contexts, just like the non-virtue of stealing, <laughs> Maybe um, it, it's still considered stealing, you know, if we were to steal money from this community, but it wouldn't be a downfall. I'll try to write and ask him. I, have, I, I might be able to get in touch with Dr. Mishi and check with that. I mean, because it does seem, yeah, it wouldn't be right for us to steal, st- take something that belongs to this community without asking, without... It does seem wrong, but maybe the question is, is it a downfall, a bodhisattva downfall? Maybe that's the question. Because it reminded me of something that I've heard or read just with regard to the ten non-virtuous actions and the one of stealing. They say that if you take something that's family property, you know, you take some money from your father or your mother, that's not considered stealing. Has anyone heard that before? Because it's considered family. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about all these nickels I used to take from my mother's drawer and go and buy candy bars <laughs> when I was a kid. <laughs> but yeah, I, I've seen that in, 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 several, in several places. That is considered not stealing because I guess it's considered you are part of that family and whatever property... Um, you know, is belonging to that family is your property. I might, that's my guess. But um, so then this reminded me of the same thing. If we are part of Shravasti Abbey community, all the property uh, of Shravasti Abbey belongs to all of us. But yeah, I think this needs to be checked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. So let me let me try to check up on that. Yeah. And too, it's maybe it's only when we study the Vinaya where it gets into finer detail. Like, you know, if the food is not freely offered in an offered space, none of us can actually go and get it, right? That's how we manage the kitchen, for example. That's, yeah. that's how it's taught, too. So We need to have rules like that. Yeah, otherwise, um, it's happened before, too, where people go in there in the middle of the night and help themselves, and then yeah. they feel very contrite and confess later. Yeah. It doesn't help your mind. <laughs> Yeah, but again, this is Vinaya, and there might be a difference between the Vinaya and the Bodhisattva vows. Well, I'll try to I'll try to find out from Dr. Rinpoche because it, it is a interesting point. We have to be sure about that too. I mean, I'm I'm sure he's not saying it's okay to do that. You know, go ahead and take whatever <laughs> from the community, but maybe the question maybe just with respect to Bodhisattva downfalls. I mean, I know Dr. Rinpoche is a very very astute scholar, and uh, he is relying on the commentary by Lama Tsongkhapa. So, but maybe something got lost in the translation or the editing or whatever. Something got, yeah, the the commentary by Lama Tsongkhapa doesn't mention anything about the value, the minimal amount of stolen property. Um, but if we use our reasoning powers it would be logical to apply the same amount indicated for the vows, uh, the Pratimoksha vows, which is at least one unit of local money. <laughs> so one dollar. <laughs> it's a little harder in India, one rupee. So um, therefore taking anything worth at least one s- unit. Oh, what, what does one unit mean, a dollar or one cent? <laughs> I mean, one cent is, nothing is worth one cent anymore. Of local currency is considered theft. But still, yeah, I mean, it's better not to take anything, even a paper clip, a piece of paper. <laughs> really be mindful of that. And, um, and he also said the motivation is the wish to acquire by theft and under the, you're under the influence of a, of a delusion, of an of a afflictive emotion. And it's for personal use. So you're taking this thing just for yourself. And you have to have the recognition that it's not mine, but belongs to the three jewels or any of the three jewels. 
because I was thinking about a situation, if it ever happened, hopefully it doesn't, but if, you know, we run out of food, we run out of donations, we're kind of starving, and maybe there's this diamond necklace that somebody had offered, and it's on the uh, on a statue of Tara, for example, could we take that and sell it and use that to buy food for the Sangha? Because the motivation there is not for personal use, but for the benefit of the Sangha, and it's compassion to feed the hungry Sangha. And um, yeah, it's just hopefully this kind of situation will never arise, but it could, it's possible. I'm sure it has happened in some Asian countries, you know, one of the communists, when monasteries were really in need of food and basic supplies. Could they sell statues or belongings to the Three Jewels in order to fulfill basic needs? There's a comment about the Chan tradition. It says, um, in the Chan tradition that I follow, there are six minor and 28 major vows. They are worded very strongly and restrictively. They are not the same as those transmitted at Shravasti. Six minor and? 28. 28 major. Major. Oh, 28 major and six minor. Oh, so there's more major ones than minor ones. Hmm. <laughs> In the um, Sutra, it says um, 10 major vowels and 48 auxiliary vowels. That's the Chinese. That's the Chinese that we take when we take the Vikram. Yeah, learning. 10 major and... 48. 48. Well, Buddhism has had so many centuries to develop and spread and be commented on. and <laughs> So, yeah, different masters, different traditions would take different things from the sutras and say, okay, these are the vows we need to keep. Okay, number six is forsaking the holy dharma. So here the downfall, this is Alex, here the downfall is to repudiate or, by voicing our opinions, cause others to repudiate that the scriptural teachings of uh, any of the three, the, the Shravaka or hearers, uh, the Prateka Buddhas or the, what are they called, solitary realizers, or bodhisattva vehicles. So any of the teachings of any of those three vehicles are the Buddha's word. So if you yourself say they're not the Buddha's word, or you say something implying that, causing anyone to think that they are not the Buddha's word. And then he goes on to explain these shravakas and pracheka buddhas, but I think we are familiar with those. Mm, yeah, denying that all or just certain scriptures of any of these vehicles that derive from the Buddha is a root downfall. And then he goes on to say, maintaining this vow does not mean forsaking a historical perspective. Buddha's teachings were transmitted orally for centuries before being committed to writing, and thus corruptions and forgeries undoubtedly occurred. The great masters who compiled a Tibetan Buddhist canon certainly rejected texts they considered inauthentic. I haven't heard that before, but it makes sense. However, instead of basing their decisions on prejudice, they used the 7th century Indian master Dharmakirti's criterion for assessing the validity of any material. And, and so Dharmakirti's uh, criterion is the ability of its practice to bring about the Buddhist goals of better rebirth, liberation, or enlightenment. So that's the criterion to use to determine if a text is valid or not. Will it bring about good rebirths, liberation, enlightenment? Stylistic differences among Buddhist scriptures, and even within a specific text, often indicate differences in time when various portions of the teachings were written down or translated into different languages. 
Therefore, studying the scriptures through methods of modern text, textual analysis can often be fruitful and does not conflict with this vow. This is what scholars do. I don't have that experience myself, but they look at scriptures and they look at the, the, the style of the language and, and things like that, and they will sometimes say, oh, this, this came much later after the Buddha, <laughs> or this style doesn't match that style. So I think scholars may sometimes, maybe often, uh, especially with the Mahayana sutras, I think they have a hard time believing that they really <laughs> were taught by the Buddha. But apparently that idea was around at the time of Nagarjuna as well, because he spoke about it, also Shantideva. So in the texts of some of the early Mahayana masters, they defended the Mahayana scriptures as being the word of Buddha. So even at that time there must have been this criticism or this rejection of certain s- sutras as being the word of Buddha or not. Difficult to know for sure. But I like Dharmakiri's criterion. If it works, <laughs> what's that, that saying we have? The proof is in the pudding? I mean, you know, if you can make something that's wonderful, fantastic, and it helps you attain liberation, enlightenment, better rebirth, then, you know, that's a good criterion for saying this is taught by the Buddha. And Dr. Ramesha mentioned that this uh, problem didn't happen in Tibet because the Tibetans accepted all the vehicles as the Buddha's word. So they acknowledged all three, you know, the, the scriptures for Shravakas, those for Pracheka Buddhas, those for Bodhisattvas, they were all taught by the Buddha. Um, but there are some countries, some countries, some cultures, some Buddhist traditions that do not accept all the sutras as the word of the Buddha. Then number seven, disrobing monastics or committing such acts as stealing their robes. This downfall refers specifically to doing something damaging to one, two, or three Buddhist monks or nuns, regardless of their moral status or level of study or practice. And it mentions later that it's the numbers, one, two, or three, uh, refer to this vow because if it's four or more, then it constitutes sangha, and that would come under the vow number three of doing something harmful. What was it, vow number three? Um, oh, vow number five, sorry. Um, stealing from the sangha. So if you take robes away from four or more um, fully ordained monks or nuns, then that becomes vow number five, stealing from the sangha. Um, Such actions need to be motivated by ill will or malice and include beating or verbally abusing them, confiscating their goods, or expelling them from their monasteries. So a lot of that happened in Tibet when the Chinese came in. Expelling monastics, however, is not a downfall if they have broken one of their four major vows. This is with regard to the bhikshus not to kill, especially another human being. Yeah, it's specifically killing a human being, not to steal, um, not to lie about spiritual attainments and to maintain celibacy. So in the case of us bhikshunis, we have eight of these uh, major downfalls, major um, defeats. So if a monastic has committed any of those either four in the case of bhikshus or eight in the case of bhikshunis. Um, And if you ask them to leave the monastery, that is not a downfall here because that's according to the Vinaya. If someone has broken any of those major vows, then they're no longer 
qualified to live with the Sangha and receive offerings and so forth. So, so in the case of this downfall, it's when you do this without justification and out of malice, out of anger. So Dr. Rameshe says, the motivation for this is the wish to harm, wishing to harm the monks or nuns. And he says, it's not, it's not a downfall if we, we think that the person has disgraced the Sangha and we want to protect the Dharma in the eyes of lay people or the Sangha from their bad influence. So there's somebody wearing monastic robes, but they're behaving disgracefully, and we ask them to, you know, take off the robes and leave, not out of malice or ill will, but because we're concerned about the Dharma and people losing faith in the Dharma and or losing faith in the Sangha, and also the influence, the the, um, effect that person would have on the other Sangha. So in that case, it would not be a downfall. So it's only if your motive is ill will, the wish to harm. And the action that you do, he said there's two two possible actions. One is either you take their robes, take away their robes, or the second is forcing them to disrobe and become a lay person, making them break their vows. So this is something I heard in Tibet, the Chinese government, Chinese army, forced monks and nuns to disrobe and sometimes even marry. So that's the kind of action mentioned here. It probably happened in many other countries like Vietnam as well, the communists, when the communists take over, they're so anti-religious. So it probably did a lot of harmful things to the monks and nuns. Okay, then number eight, um, committing any of the five heinous crimes which are killing your mother, killing your father, killing an arhat, uh, drawing blood from a Buddha with a bad intention. He he includes that because people sometimes wonder, what if a Buddha goes to the doctor and has to have a blood test? (laughs) The doctor or the nurse, you know, committing this. No, no, no. It's with a bad intention, not with good intention. And then the fifth one is causing a split in the monastic community, or the term is usually schism. And um, so that one refers to repudiating the Buddhist teachings and monastic institutions, drawing monastics away from them, and enlisting them in one's own newly founded religion and monastic tradition. And it does not refer to leaving a dharma center or organization, especially because of corruption in the organization or its spiritual teachers, and founding another center that still follows the Buddha's teachings. So I guess Alex had been asked about that, you know, that if you leave one Buddhist organization because not being happy with what's going on there, and then you go and found another one, is that causing a schism in the Sangha? People might wonder about that. So he says, no. Um, and he says, moreover, the term Sangha in this heinous crime refers specifically to the monastic community. It is not referred to Sangha in the non traditional usage as coined by Western Buddhists as an equivalent of the congregation of a Dharma center or organization. Yeah, so in the West, there's this tendency to use the word sangha in a very loose way, referring to anybody, lay and monastic, who come to a, a dharma center. I heard it in Israel, like when people would start teaching meditation and they have a little meditation group, they use the word sangha, even though those people may not even be Buddhist. <laughs> so it's become very, very loose. Um, but... Uh, Yeah, so here it strictly refers to a monastic community. And um, in Abhidharma Kosha, Vasubandhu's um, text, Abhidharma Kosha, he has a very detailed explanation of what is a schism, 
which constitutes this fifth uh, heinous crime. And the way that's explained, it can only occur at the Buddhist time. It cannot occur any other time. Have you heard that explanation before? Yeah, so it's, ref- it's specifically about the Sangha at the time of the Buddha <laughs> and Devadatta being the instigator. And it even says, you know, once the Buddha has passed away, that particular action can no longer be committed. So that's only in the Abhidharma Kosha, and the Abhidharma Kosha is explained according to the Vaibhashika school. So I don't know if other, the other schools would agree with that very strict interpretation. But still, it's not a good thing to do to cause a, a group of, of uh, monastics to get into a conflict with each other and split up and um, you know, become disharmonious. So that's something to be avoided. But to be a heinous crime, you know, for that kind of thing to be a... Because a heinous crime is really heavy. Uh, they say that if you've committed one of those and you didn't purify it, it's, you you go straight to hell without even going through the bardo. It's uh, a very, very heavy thing. And that's understandable with killing your mother or your father or an arhat or drawing the blood from a Buddha, but causing a, co- a community to be disrupted doesn't seem quite as bad. And also the reason, um, uh, Vasubandhu said, the reason it was such a heavy thing at the time of the Buddha is because as long as that schism was in place, as long as there was that split among the Buddha's followers, nobody could gain any realizations. It kind of stopped the possibility of realizations occurring in their minds. So that's why it was so bad. Number nine is holding a distorted antagonistic outlook. Sometimes it's described as holding wrong views. And it means to deny what is true and of value, such as the laws of karma, refuge, rebirth, the possibility of liberation. So denying things like that, and then being antagonistic towards such ideas and those who hold them. And Dr. Parimashe said, the nature of this downfall is identical to the 10th non-virtue, non-virtuous action, number 10, wrong views. Um, The action is to deny the existence of any of these things, even though you know that they do exist. So it sounds like you have to, you have to already have the knowledge that these things do exist, but for some reason you just reject them, deny them. So it's, again, not the same as doubt. It's normal, natural to have doubt in rebirth and even karma, the possibility of liberation and enlightenment, because we cannot prove that these things really exist or not at our level. We can't see if they exist or not. So it's normal to have doubt, but doubt, we need to investigate our doubts and not get stuck and continue having more and more doubt because eventually that can turn into this wrong view. Um, So it's better to just keep an open mind and think, well, I can't, no, I don't know for sure, but maybe it's possible. And I'll just go along under that assumption <laughs> because, um, you know, tentatively believing in things like rebirth and karma enables us to live a good life, to live an ethical life, to behave ourselves. Whereas if we don't believe in them, then we could become careless and do non-virtuous things so it's, it's, it's better to assume that they are true, even if we're not 100% sure. And for this downfall, and the last one, number 18, if we commit this one, the four binding factors are not required. So the four binding factors I mentioned before um, are only required for the 16 of the root downfalls, but two, this one and the last one, which are giving up bodhicitta. 
as soon as those occur, you may, you've created a downfall. You've lost your Bodhisattva vows. But you can take them again. It's still negative, though. Very negative. So we have to be very careful. The next one, number 10. I'll just do this one and then we'll stop and see if there's any questions. Um, destroying places such as towns. I always wondered what this one is doing in there. Like, why would I do such a thing? But <laughs> um, some of the Buddha's followers were kings and princes, generals, people who could have been in such a position to do things like this. So Alex says, this downfall includes intentionally demolishing, bombing, or degrading the environment of a town, city, district, or countryside area, and rendering it unfit, harmful, or difficult for humans or animals to live in. And Dr. Ramesh's commentary says that this refers only to places, not people. So you're actually destroying the abodes where people live, and not necessarily the people themselves. The motivation behind this action is the intention to destroy, um, provoked by one of the afflictive emotions, possibly anger, that's probably the usual one, or attachment. And this could happen during a war, for example, or arson, you know, if you just want to, you're angry at somebody, you burn down their house. And people sometimes wonder about things like ant hills or, I don't know, places where animals live. Um, beehives, maybe. What else? Beaver dens. <laughs> Would that be included here? The way Dr. Ramesha explains it, it's, he's talking more about people, um, places where people live, like towns and cities. I mean, of course, it wouldn't be nice to destroy an anthill unless there was a reason for it. I don't know if there could be a reason for destroying an anthill. I mean, if you're building and you have to raise the ground, you know, clear the ground, to bless the land for Gotami, there was an anthill in the, the meadow, and we took huge shovels and tarps and got as much of that, that it was not a real, like that, some of the because we have, but we took that, that thing and put it gently, piece by piece, as much as we could, and then we gently pulled it into the forest, and within a few days, it had pretty much re <laughs> reassembled itself, and then we, I think we waited a little bit to make sure that the little ants that were left kind of went away. But we were, we did that, and we blessed it with incense because that's where the building was going to be. So, mm -hmm. yeah, with the intention of doing as harmlessly as we could. Yeah. So your intention wasn't to cause harm to the beings, but you wanted to build. This they would have building. been harmed if we had just John had just come in and just whoever you know excavated. Yeah, so it was done in a very gentle, compassionate way, as uh, non-harmfully as possible. So, yeah, I'm just wondering what kind of situations would this have been done? I guess, yeah, a king or a leader um, wanting to punish another population, and yeah, this kind of thing has probably happened all throughout history. <laughs> like in Syria, for example, just bombing um, cities, although I don't know if the intention there is just to destroy their buildings, but also to kill the people. But sometimes, yeah, to punish people, leaders, well, this certainly happens in Israel, um, when a Palestinian is convict is accused of of a crime the government will go in and destroy their whole house like not, not you know the whole family loses their home as a, that would never happen in this country like these kids in Newport who were 
um, like, um, arrested for the murder, the government wouldn't go in and destroy their houses where their parents and their siblings are living. That's what they do in Israel. Anyway, so, yeah, destroying houses, destroying cities and towns and so on. is often done to hmm? Burma. Yeah, the Rohingya people. Yeah, burning their villages, driving them out. Very sad. Anyway, I, I, to me it just seems like if you're taking bodhisattva vows, to then go and do something like that would be so obviously contrary to the whole intention of the bodhisattva. But maybe at the time of the Buddha, it was necessary to make a vow about that because some of the Buddha's followers were in positions where they could do such a thing. So I'll stop there for today. We'll continue next week with others. If there are any questions. The question is, is it safe in terms of contents to read books about the path written by psychologists or any other Western writers? Do they usually comply with the scriptures? Sometimes it looks like it becomes a kind of new trend and you don't know how to identify it as a correct teaching. So psychologists writing books about Dharma, is that the, yeah. Well, I think it's good to study, you know, Buddha's teachings from qualified Buddhist teachers so that you do know um, what is the correct <laughs> path as, you know, as taught by the Buddha and then carried on by the masters over the centuries like Lama Tsongkhapa and so on. So as long as you know um, that way of explaining things, and then if you read a book by a Western psychologist who might be talking about the Dharma, then you would at least have the correct understanding and you'd be able to pick out if there are any errors or distortions in in that person's um, explanation. So I wouldn't recommend relying on a Western psychologist, unless that person has really done a lot of study of the Buddhist teachings and does have the correct understanding. And um, But yeah, to, just to be on the safe side, it's good if you yourself rely on um, traditional teachers and teachings so that you do know that way of explaining things. And then you can know for yourself, you can check for yourself if what this psychologist is saying is correct or not. So I wouldn't say don't read those books because <laughs> they might contain some very helpful ideas on how to integrate traditional Buddhist teachings into Western life. But yeah, just have that awareness that some of the things might not be 100% accurate. But it's a good question. Another one? <laughs> uh, this is in reference to number six. Does the word of the Buddha in this context mean the historical Buddha, or could it be anyone who has attained awakening since the historical Buddha? Um, good question. I think it seems to mean the historical Buddha because it's talking about the um, the various vehicles that the Buddha taught. The vehicle uh, for the hearers and the solitary realizers who aspire to attain um, nirvana, personal liberation, and the uh, bodhisattva's vehicle for those who want to attain full enlightenment Buddhahood. So Buddha kind of set in motion the Dharma. They talk about the turning the wheel of Dharma. So he explained these different vehicles in his, in his teachings. and um, So I think it mainly refers to that. So if you were to say, you know, those teachings, those the teachings involved in those vehicles were not taught by the historical Buddha. That's the main way in which one would uh, commit this downfall. And it's also maybe a little hard to know sometimes who else has become a Buddha. <laughs> I mean, sometimes... You know, followers might talk about their particular teacher as the second Buddha, or maybe the third Buddha. 
<laughs> but yeah, if they're really a Buddha or not, I don't know. I'm in no position to say. But normally, I think this vow would be would be referring to Shakyamuni Buddha, the um, historical Buddha, the founder Buddha. There's a teaching that Venerable gave years ago on the Vajrasattva practice. I think of Vajrapani or Medicine Buddha somewhere. And there was a psychologist in the room, and he was really talking about how he utilized the Dharma and stuff and really helped people. And she, she would gently keep coming back and saying, but remember that the motivation for, is for liberation and awakening, not just for bringing peace and healing of just this life. Because he was really making it sound like he had he, she just wanted to keep him on a, a, an understanding of what his motivation were, were, was not quite exactly for the long term of what the Dharma is for, and to use it and understand that that's what's happening is the happiness of just this life, not the, mm. the, 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 the true motivation for why you <clears throat> practice the Dharma. So, Yeah, but I just remembered that talk that Bhikkhu Bodhi gave at the beginning of the recent monastic uh, Western, what do we call it? Western monastic gathering. Did you listen to that talk? Because he was, I don't remember the exact words, but he was talking about how, you know, there's not that many people who are really intent on attaining nirvana and enlightenment. And there's just so much of the Dharma. I mean, this is how I understand it, my kind of paraphrase of it. There's so much in the Dharma that can be so helpful to people to be happier, to have, you know, more love and compassion and more ethics and so on. So, Seem to be saying maybe that's what we need to emphasize now. Not to disregard those other things, but just to, I, I have the feeling that's what will appeal to the greatest right, number of people. Right. But the, the, the sense in the talk between Venerable and the psychologist is that he was really honing in that he was a, he was a, a, a psychologist who was a Dharma practitioner, but it, he, she just kept going back to saying, just understand that the motivation is slightly different than what the Dharma is meant to accomplished. So, you know, yeah. within the context of healing and helping people in the world, there's a lot in it but to understand. And this, like with the mindfulness movement, I mean, it's wonderful that so many people are practicing mindfulness, but they've sort of taken mindfulness out of the context of Buddhism and just taught that alone without ethics, without compassion, without you know, the, the big picture. So, yes, it is beneficial, but the danger is some people might think that's all there is to Buddhism. Buddhism is only about that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, some of us are determined to keep the big picture alive and well and <laughs> practice it and teach it to others as well. It says, if you don't help someone, how do you know they have other resources? As somebody else said, if we all think the, person, the people in need will be helped by someone else, then they wouldn't receive help. Yeah, well, I guess it's hard to know unless you just talk to them, you know, just try to find out more about the person. I mean, I'm not saying, and I'm sure Dr. Ramesh is not saying this either, that you have to interrogate a person before you give them a, a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe if they're asking for a lot, you know, and you really want to find out more about this person, where they're coming from, you know, what their situation is, then you can just kind of gently ask those questions. I don't know. It's I guess you just have to take each situation as it comes and and if you have if it's just a small amount of money or food, then probably better just to give it and not um, worry if the person really needs it or not. One more question, then we'll stop. So these vowels are gathered from different uh, sutras, different scriptures. Did the Buddha ever precede any of them with saying, this is a bodhisattva vow, like that category? Did the Buddha talk about it himself or did later... I don't know. People compile them and then call I these don't bodhisattva don't know. Vows. One would have to really go into the <laughs> sutras and, and um, yeah. And, and so many of the sutras, especially the Mahayana sutras, are not even translated into English. So one would have to know Tibetan or Chinese or Sanskrit to be able to look into them. Um, 
we do have, I think we have a translation now of the uh, Bodhisattva Bhumi. I have to check in a library. The Bodhisattva Bhumi has been, it's been translated. It's quite big. It's either one big book or two big books, three big books. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe somebody has a time one day. One can go into that. And But yeah, I think we just have to have some trust in these great masters of the past, that they were very astute and mm, didn't just invent things, make things up. But yeah, that would be something to investigate. Where did a Sangha, you know, pull out these and what did the Buddha himself actually say and so on. <laughs> 